as we reflect upon what God's word has to say to us, let us ask for guidance from God's Holy Spirit and let us come together in faith and prayer. Let us pray. Lord, help what we consider. As you have given us the gift of your word, so give us also, we pray, the gift of your spirit to understand your word. The left to ourselves, we have but reason and experience, and for what you would reveal to us, Lord, it's far too limited. So we ask, Lord, we pray that we will be blessed together by this word we have shared, and now as we think about it together, Lord, help our understanding to lead us to new and renewing service, to grow and build up your church, and in all things we say and do to bring you glory and praise. This in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are people in the world today who make being God like a thing to try for, a thing to be grasped. The example that Jesus sets is through, though being verily God, he takes on the form of a servant being human, even to the point of dying, dying a very shameful death, a very tragic death upon the cross. A death that one of us who's guilty of everything should have borne. We're guilty of every sin we've ever committed. Yet he was labeled with our guilt and for the crimes of his accusers. And in Jesus, we are shown the truest example of what it means to really be godly. And all these godlike stars and leaders are rightly put to shame and put in their place. For this is Lord of Lords that was upon the cross, that leaves behind an empty tomb and goes before us to glory. Instead of respecting this, we celebrate those who have charismatic speech of symmetric values in their features, who are tall, dark, and handsome, who are rejoiced in for their fortunes and their fame. I love the description that Isaiah puts out to God's people as the model, the physical model for the Messiah. In verse 50, sorry, in chapter 53, at verse 2, For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of a dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as for one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. We esteemed him not. In other words, Jim Cavazel, who played Jesus in the critically acclaimed 2004 The Passion of the Christ, or any other pretty well I'm not going to be too nitpicky about the movie stars who have depicted Jesus, but they're all, in my opinion, pretty good-looking lads and far too handsome to really be accurate about Jesus. Jesus' ministry was far too authentic to have all that flash and flair that we expect from our evangelists, even today's ministers or church worship leaders and teams. God is good above and beyond all our ideas about what is good and important. And if you have been diminishing your contribution, if you have been down talking or downplaying the contribution that you have to make, should be making to the work of the church, please, it's time to step up, step back from such ideas and even if you find yourself humbled, especially if you find yourself humbled, know that you are in a terrific place, coming from a perfect experience to be able to share what you have to share about faith. When God's people, they sought for a leader, they wouldn't accept the judges 
or the prophets that God had chosen by gifts and abilities and holy presence. No, God's people wanted what? They wanted a king like the other countries had. And so they chose Saul, who was tall and handsome and a good speaker, was strong and an able fighter. And the end result was, well, things started off fairly good, but the end result was that Saul wanted people to follow who? Saul, and not God. When push came to shove, Saul pushed prophets and wisdom away for selfish glory and became jealous of the success of those, especially David, who were protecting God's people. Before he ever fell by his own sword, he was well defeated by his own pride. Yet somewhere in all the ways humanity was falling away from God, God's glory was coming ever nearer. Prophets foretold him, and we know our greatest freedom in the adoration of one who is preeminent as the revelation of God, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. That revelation? Or the way the book of Hebrews journeys us through all the Old Testaments, testifying that now faith is confident in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Our faith does not manifest the will or the power of God as we do. It does not affect evoke God into action in our prayers, but by prayers and in our faith, we declare our willingness to participate in the will of God and vice versa. So our disobedience and silence and selfishness and sin does not keep God's God from God's purpose and the fulfillment of God's intent, but causes us to miss out on the full experience of what God lovingly offers us in the beauty of our creation and in the vocation tied to our being, body, mind, and soul. So when Jesus says and then reminds his disciples and us, the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. We are meant to know that God is ahead of our sin, of your sin. You are never going to fall further than God can catch you. You are never going to sin so bad that God will reject you unless it is your intent to utterly reject and mock God's Holy Spirit in blasphemy. And that is not for us to decide who has done this or not or to put ourselves in the place of God and God's judgment, but to guide one another in the grace of God as to honor God's abundant love bestowed upon every one of us. You know, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, I have run the race and I have fought the good fight. He was not talking about a race against God, but a race with God in which Christ Jesus makes all of us victors, not by pushing us across the, the line ahead of us, but in holding our hand as in him all things are accomplished and we are justified, not for our actions, but in our acceptance and our holding on to Christ, who already holds unto us, as Paul testifies to the Galatians, saying, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That is the meaning resonating in the depiction of what wisdom really is that we shared in a, in a reading today from Proverbs chapter 8. For wisdom is the meeting of love and faith and grace and peace in spirit and perfectly in God's Holy Spirit. This is why we recognize the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit in moments of clarity and revelation, not just ecstasy, but when such spiritual excitement is interpretable and unambiguous. We know God is with us when we realize that God is already before us, supporting us, shielding us, and embracing us. And it is then that we experience the fullest reality of what it means to be the church. This is the opening of heaven. Pastor of the Stonebriar Community Church and the media group Insight for Living, Charles Swindle, once wrote, 
Don't expect wisdom to come into your life like great chunks of rock on a conveyor belt. It isn't like that. It's not splashy and bold, nor is it dispensed like prescription across some counter. Wisdom comes privately from God and as a byproduct of right decisions, godly reactions, and the application of spiritual principles to daily circumstances. Wisdom comes not from trying to do great things for God, but more from being faithful to small, obscure tasks that few people will ever see. So God proceeds with us, already before us, and has Christ, as Christ promises, even unto heaven, that he is preparing a place for us, that we may be where he is. Amen and God bless you.